in a brand new series in the Gospel of John. Someone said to me last Sunday, I thought we were in Matthew. Well, we were in Matthew uh, for Christmas. We spent some time in Matthew and then we shifted gears into the Gospel of John. Last Sunday, we opened with an overview, a, a, a broad spectrum, broad picture approach to the opening five verses. And this morning, we're going to, by God's grace, should the Lord give us uh, his, um, his, his goodness in this regard, we're going to tackle verses 6 all the way down and including verse 14. But I'm going to read from verse 1 again because it really is the, the proper launching pad for this section of text that we want to study this morning. Now, by way of introduction, we've already seen in last Sunday's uh, message, we've seen that John is attempting to introduce this outsider this person who doesn't come from our world. Now, we spent a lot of time last week laboring the caveat that we're not trying to say that Jesus is less than human. He is truly human. But we are trying to emphasize, we're trying to make it a, a point of emphasis that he is truly God and that Jesus' perspective is therefore unique. It's, 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 it, not only is it unique, it's necessary. And we see in the life of Jesus, not always appreciated. So while John is continuing this introduction, as we'll pick up our reading this morning from verse 1 in John chapter 1, we'll see that John begins to rally some support from other prophets and, and well-known, well-respected men of God, most specifically John the Baptist. So if you would, join with me again in a reading of this wonderful gospel, John chapter 1, starting at verse 1, we'll read all the way through and including verse 14. These are now the words of our good and holy God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives lights to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. May God bless the reading of his own precious word. Now, it became apparent to me about a sentence in that we were not reading the normal English Standard Translation because my Bible app defaults often to what is my own private, personal favorite in devotional reading, the New King James. So most of our exposition will be from the English Standard Version, what you're used to, what you're probably trying to follow along. The vast majority of that wording is identical. A good portion of it is similar. Some of it will seem dissimilar, but I thought I didn't want to break off in the reading there just to change translation because I love the New King James, and so I thought, what a wonderful privilege to read from that this morning. But we will exposit the English Standard Version, and we will dial in upon this main point this morning, spoken of the prophet, the baptizer, John, he was not the light. He was not the light. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was not the light. It's a strange way to introduce this enigmatic New Testament personality, John the Baptist, by initially starting out with something of a negation. You start out by describing what John isn't, what John failed to be, what John could never be. Some scholars and commentators have suggested that this particular gospel, of all four, John's gospel is, is, is kind of antagonistic toward the baptizer. And some people draw that conclusion from remarks like this, where most other synoptic gospels, or the other three synoptics, spend a lot of time introducing John early on as the preacher of repentance and, and, and the forerunner and the fulfiller of prophecy and the baptizer, the first thing you learn from John about John the Baptist, the first thing you learn is he's not the light. He's not the light. We're going to spend some time this morning detailing and discovering what can be learned 
from this, but just a remark about New Testament names it can be confusing sometimes. Even in that little diatribe of mine, I had to be really careful. Did you notice it? To distinguish John, the guy who wrote John, and John the Baptist. I, I remember one time years ago, I was in a, I was in a seminary. Uh, it, it was like a, how do I describe it? It was like a, a day-long intensive seminar uh, with world-renowned New Testament scholar D.A. Carson who had flown out to Australia. I wasn't a student at the time. I was one of the organizers of the event. And D.A. Carson flew out to, to do this event. And, and it was, the room was full of pastors and, and Bible students and, and scholars and academics. And, and, and this middle-aged man stood up. There was a Q&A format. He didn't just stand up and interrupt the presentation. It was a Q&A format. And he stood up and asked D.A. Carson... He said, I have a question for you. And he asked this very labyrinth of a question about the book of Revelation, the disciple John, John the baptizer. And in the end, it all boiled down to his, this man had this complete confused idea of the entire New Testament based upon the fact that somewhere he had thought that John the disciple and John the Baptist were the same guy. And you can only imagine how much that would hamstring you and contaminate your ability to understand the unfolding narrative of the New Testament if you don't at least have some semblance of an idea of the personalities. This happens more than once. Not only is the New Testament replete with Johns, there's plenty of Johns, other characters are much the same. There's more than one Jesus in the New Testament. I know it sounds like I've profaned and I've spoken blasphemy, but there are, there are people in the New Testament that have the name Jesus that aren't the Jesus Later in the New Testament, they often change their name or they, they add some kind of descriptor or, 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 or way of understanding that they're not the Christ. But another good example is Herod. We meet with a character, Herod, throughout the New Testament, and just about every time we read Herod, it's a different guy. And you don't always know that because the, the name Herod, after Herod the Great, who built his Herodian empire, every subsequent person that rose to the throne of Herod just called themselves Herod. And so you, you might be reading your New Testament, right? And you read about the Herod at the birth of Jesus who slaughtered the, the, the infants in Bethlehem and then the, the Herod that, that John, the, John the Baptist rebukes. You remember John the Baptist rebukes him for taking his sister's wife and this is how John the Baptist dies. Sorry for the spoiler alert if you don't know this. Different Herod. Different Herod. And not only that, in, in, in later on in the New Testament as you're reading the book of Acts and you come across a, another Herod that starts persecuting the Christians, putting them to death. He imprisons Peter. And then he, he himself, he, he has this gruesome death where he falls off his throne and his, his innards just spill out and there's worms and gunk in there. And it's, it's written in the book of Acts like the judgment of God. Different Herod. It's about every time it's a, it's a different Herod. Some of you, you didn't know that. Your mind is just... Wow, I'm never going to read my Bible the same way again. You take this moment, maybe it would be prudent to just sidetrack and say, one of the best ways that you can defend against this form of confusion, which if you're just reading the naked words on the page is not always obvious, is to own a really good, robust study Bible. And if pastorally speaking, as the lead pastor here, I can make a recommendation, I have no hesitation predominantly giving you this recommendation that the English Standard Version Crossway Study Bible is a brilliant resource to just have on hand. I wouldn't say read all your Bible from a study Bible. You, it's hard in the end to not, to not associate the study notes and elevate them to the, the authority of the text of the actual scripture. That, that can be hard for some people. But I would say if you own that resource, for the most part, you're going to be able to make these distinctions. So in John chapter 1, we have the disciple John introducing us to the one who is the baptizer, the forerunner, the prophet. And the most important thing that we are supposed to learn at this early juncture about John the baptizer is that he's not the light. He's not the light. This is that John the disciple, the author of the gospel of John, wants us to learn something by contrast. He, he wants you to have already in your thinking, he wants you to have already the convictions about who John the baptizer is so that when 
John the disciple, this is getting really convoluted, but I hope you're following at least till this point. When John the disciple writes about John the baptizer, you at least know something of the magnitude of the man. As we crystallize and clarify truth through contrast. Now, we could say a lot of things about John the baptizer. I know you're used to hearing him called John the Baptist. He wasn't a Baptist, not a Presbyterian, not an Episcopalian or a Lutheran, right? He was John the Baptizer. I don't mind if you say John the Baptist, but it often does get confused with being the uh, denominational Baptist. I've heard people argue this. Well, Baptists have been around since before Jesus. Have you never heard of John the Baptist? Slightly misleading, of course. We could spend a lot of time detailing the magnificent events surrounding John the Baptizer's life but it's all summarized in the words of Jesus in Matthew 11, 11. So let me give you this text and this summary of Jesus himself, speaking of his half-cousin, John the Baptizer. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now that second point is a point of application where we are supposed to understand that when God ranks greatness in his kingdom, in the kingdom economy, service is greater than mastery. Following humbly is greater than leading with authority. That's, that's clearly the upside down value ethic of the kingdom of Christ. We're going to leave that. It's not the main point. We're going to zero in on the first portion of what Jesus said. Of all people who have ever been born to a woman, that's a pretty exhaustive category, right? You feel that? That's pretty exhaustive. You might only have an exception in maybe Adam. That's it. Every other person among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Do we suspect that perhaps Jesus is a little guilty here of hyperbole? Is he, is he exaggerating? Well, we can't believe that. We can't believe that because Jesus opens up by saying, truly I say to you, verily I say to you. In the Greek, it's amen, I'm speaking the truth. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating for the, for, the, for the point. I'm trying to stress this to you, that John the Baptist is so very great. You can't exaggerate this man. John the baptizer, the larger than life, enigmatic Half-cousin of Jesus is the prophet of all prophets. In fact, the Gospel of John has told you this in a very idiomatic way by saying there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, when you read that, again, at just the simple naked words on the page, the, the bare text, you may not be aware that there's an idiom being used, an idiom that stretches all the way back into the Old Testament era, where it would speak of prophets that came were men sent from God. If you've got a pen and you like to write down references, let me just rapid fire some references to you in case later you want to check these out. And if you don't have a pen but you want them, this message will be on YouTube probably later today, if not by tomorrow. You can go back and look into these individually if you like to do that. Here are some references. 2 Chronicles 24.19, 25.15, Jeremiah 7.25. Jeremiah 25, 4, 28, 9, and 35, 15, and 44, 4. The Jewish crowds, moreover, so that's all the Old Testament references. It's it's just a sampling. There are vastly more that could be offered. But that this phrase, this idiom, a man sent from God, was meant to speak of authority and title, and it was meant to speak of power that God had endued him with. Moreover, the Jewish crowds regarded John, the baptizer, as a prophet. You can see this in Matthew 21, 26, Mark 11, 32, and Luke 20, verse 6. And this is how Jesus also described him in Matthew 11, 9, Luke 7, 26. Now, what's really curious about John the baptizer is his identity, we're going to see this. We're going to see this back and forth later on in John chapter one, where authorities from Jerusalem come to John the Baptizer and say, "Who on earth are you? Are you the Christ? Are you Elijah? Or are you the prophet that is to come?" 
Now, learn from this that such was the power and the magnitude of John the baptizer that even those that were not sympathizers with his mission wanted to know if he qualified as any one of those three chief prophets and men sent from God. We know that he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And this was very significant indeed. If you just read your New Testament, and that alone is your source for understanding the ministry of John the Baptist and the magnitude, the enormity of the ministry, you'll miss something. Historians tell us that such was the preaching of this fairly crazy-eyed, desert-dwelling, locust-eating, honey-drinking prophet, such was the magnitude and enormity of his ministry that his preaching emptied the entire towns and villages around Jerusalem. There's something in this that resembles some of the more modern revival phenomena that we read in history. I remember the story of the 19, I believe it was late 40s, early 50s, Hebrides revival in Scotland. Some of you know the history of the story. But the power of God showed up in such an incredible way in what otherwise was described as, not by me, but by, by, by those that were there in the time, in the 1940s and 50s in the Hebrides in Scotland, otherwise was a fairly dry and dusty and stale form of old Presbyterianism. The Spirit of God just turned up in such explosive power that one story records that in the middle of the night, without an announcement being made, without something going around and knocking on doors and waking people and arousing from their sleep, hundreds of people one night just all turned up at church at the same time in fear for the power of God. And the story goes that on that very night, while this whole community just turned up at the church, not knowing why they were there, except they all felt this reverential awe and terror at the, at the, at the nearness of God, that there was a... There was a dance going on in the dance hall down the road. And the power of God came and hit that dance hall with such ferocity that eyewitness reports tell you that the people began fleeing from the dance hall as though they were fleeing from a plague. It's a staggering story. If you ever have time uh, this afternoon or during the week, go and Google the events of the Hebridean revival in Scotland. Something very similar to that is occurring in the ministry of John the Baptist. He's not sending out flyers. He's not employing a, a PR representative or going on some, some, some campaign. He's not utilizing social media and the internet to get the word out. He's standing in the desert. He's preaching and thousands begin to emerge from the towns and villages all around Jerusalem. It's an astounding thing to behold. Such is the magnitude that the people in Jerusalem get really concerned about this. We've talked before about the, about the significance of baptism. We're not going to go into that just again this morning, but John starts baptizing them to ready them for the coming of the Messiah. Such is the enormity of his ministry that the professional religious elite of Jerusalem come and ask for a reason as to why he has found such power among the people. We read this in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11 Let me read chapter 2, verse 1, and then 11 to 12. This is to bring in the reference to the power of the prophet Elijah. Now, when the Lord was about to take up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, and Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, and he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into pieces. This records for you the very end of the prophet Elijah on planet earth. He didn't undergo the natural process of death. And so the thinking was, particularly among the Jewish religious elite, is that Elijah has to return in that very bodily form that he rose. Now, this Elijah, if we had time this morning, oh, I would love to spend a few moments on Elijah. This guy was a freak in every sense of the word. At the simple command of his lips, the entire nation of Israel underwent 
a famine and a drought that lasted years. And then to alleviate that, once finally Elijah had seen that the drought fulfilled its purposes, through his prayers, God sent refreshing rain, which immediately rejuvenated the land of Israel and its economy. This is the same Elijah that took on 400 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, mocking them, brought fire down from heaven, and then took them down and killed them all in one moment. This is Elijah. I know this feels like something like a Saturday morning cartoon special for your adolescent children, maybe some kind of anime thought. This, that's not what this is. This is the true historicity of what God is doing among men. And Elijah, the power and the spirit thereof, becomes resident in the prophet John the Baptist. There was this thought then that Elijah has to return. In fact, in the late Old Testament age, <clears throat> there was a prophecy of Elijah's return spoken explicitly in Malachi. Let me give you this text in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. It says, Behold, I send you, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Here's the summary of all of this. John is a really big deal. It sounds pithy, sounds glib, but it's simply the truth of it. Stack up your favorite Old Testament prophet, Old Testament hero, Old Testament mighty person of God. Stack them up. You love... Heroes like Samson or David or Moses, Abraham, Deborah, Jeremiah, whoever you like, and know that in Jesus' own estimation, none of them hold a spark to the luminous sun that is John the Baptist. All of them pale into insignificance in contrast to the magnitude of John the Baptist. Now, all that being true, maybe you start thinking to yourself, why isn't there more time taken up in the New Testament to talk about John the Baptist then? And the answer is very clear. The answer is right before your eyes on the pages of John 1 because he is not the light. And the New Testament serves as the record of when the light of God shines into humanity's darkness in the very personal presence of Jesus Christ the Lord. At the top of the pile of all of these Old Testament men and women of renown, of prophetic power, stands John the Baptist alone. So why is he described here as not the light? In fact, John says he only came to bear witness about the light. The truth is that here is the importance of why John wants to, John the disciple wants to bring in John the Baptist to be in reference at this point in time. Because when John is writing his gospel, to an audience of people who very much knew about John the Baptist. They knew about his exploits, his, his glory, his power with people. They, they understood that he brought a revival to Israel, the likes of which Israel had never previously experienced. And John wants to emphasize, John the disciple wants to emphasize that even John the Baptist was not the light. He was an indicator he was pointing. He, he is a road sign to describe the one who was to come. Now, curiously, I don't know if you've ever thought this was curious, but let me offer you this curiosity. John the Baptist is called a prophet. He's called a prophet by the Old Testament standards. He's called a prophet by, by the crowds of Israel, and he's called a prophet by Jesus. In order to be a prophet, you have to what? Prophesy. Come on, that was, that was a fairly easy one. That was, a, that was a softball. Can we try again? In order to be called a prophet, you have to? There we go. Straight A's. What a great class. So did John prophesy. I've heard preachers and commentators say, John the Baptist is the prophet who doesn't prophesy. Because part of us, in our thinking of what prophecy is, we, we tend to always have this very apocalyptic idea that if you're going to prophesy, it always sounds like the end is nigh, right? The solar eclipse is coming. The world's going to be dissolved into dust. Like there's this always this thought, that's what prophecy is. 
Prophecy is always about the, the great foreboding destruction of the end, and that's not always or even often biblical prophecy. In fact, John did prophesy. The one and only prophecy that John gave and repeated time and again is the immediate and imminent arrival of the one, the light, the Messiah. So John chapter 1 verse 15 in our text this morning says, John bore witness about him and he cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. It's a clear statement in this, a clear statement in this of the eternality of the person of the Son of God, of the Son of God. Of course, in the chronology of human history, John the Baptist's ministry starts prior to the advent of Jesus' ministry. But John wants those that will listen to know that Jesus doesn't just come at a point in space-time, that Jesus is eternal as the very Son of God. He was before me. He was before me. He ranks before me, which means above me. That's clear, because he was before me. Because this Jesus Christ is not just truly man, he is eternally and truly every bit divine. Now we will have ample time to consider more about this character, John the Baptist, further in chapter 1. Later on, we'll rediscover this person. But the author of this gospel has a very specific point at this juncture in mentioning him. John is described as not the light. Not because there's a desire to downplay John the, John the Baptist, but because the true light is coming. What this may seem as a slight on John the Baptist is in fact not, not even close. No matter how great John the baptizer is, Jesus is greater. And the best way to describe anyone who's great, anyone who's amazingly gifted, powerful before God and powerful before man, is they're not Jesus. They're never going to be Jesus. They're always going to be just an imitation, even a cheap imitation of Jesus. No matter who it is, even if it's John the Baptist, or even if it's your, your favorite Christian author or musical artist or, or, or preacher or, or pastor, whoever it is, if you've started to believe that they can be Jesus for you, you are setting yourself up for grave disappointment. There's only one Jesus. There's only one perfect, harmless, holy, undefiled Messiah. John chapter 1 verse 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Let's read, in fact, verse 9 through to 13 and spend some time teasing out the implications of all that John the disciple wants us to consider in light of John the baptizer. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Isn't this a bizarre description of the relationship that the Son of God has with the world? Isn't this a clear denunciation of the sinfulness and the rebellion and the depravity of humanity? That Jesus Christ spoke these worlds into existence before time began. Now, please excuse me. If I, if I call the eternal Son of God Jesus Christ, you will at least understand I'm trying to speak of the eternal Son of God, who not only created the world, but the Bible says he sustains the world by the word of his power. By the word of his power. It's actually very graphic imagery. What it is suggesting is that as Jesus is sustaining, the Son of God is sustaining the material world, every fiber of our being is being currently held together by the very word of Jesus' power. And such is the fallenness of humanity, such is, such is, our, is our depravity and our rebellion and the effects of sin that people don't even know, that people don't even know. They're not even aware that their very material existence is being held together by the word of the power of the Son of God. And when the Son of God comes into our world, they didn't know him. They didn't recognize him. They mocked and rejected him. 
They beaten and tore at his beard and his hair and his garments. They nailed him to a cross, failing to recognize that this very Son of God sustains all existence in its very current state of life. He was in the world. This speaks of before the incarnation of the Son. Get a little bit technical for a moment. I know you can handle it. Before the very incarnation of the Son in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God is truly divine and fully God and has all of the properties and predicates and attributes of God. He's omnipresent. And the world was made through him, but they didn't know him. And then verse 11, he came to his own, but his own people didn't even receive him. They did not receive him. It's staggering. In fact, it's staggering. Some of you have heard me say this before. It becomes even comical at certain points in Jesus' ministry. It becomes comical. If you can understand the true nature of who Jesus is, that is truly God, eternally God, it becomes laughable. Laughable. Jesus would say things like, before Abraham was, I am. The grammar isn't even very good, right? If you turn that in for an English exam, the, uh, the professor might put a red line through it and say, before Abraham was, I was. I am is the wrong tense. But it's the only appropriate tense. When you are divine and God, in every sense of the word, you do an injustice to limited human grammar and vocabulary. And then what do they say? This is, this is, you have to feel the comedic nature of this. You remember what they said to him? But you're not yet even 50 years old. Do they know how long ago Abraham lived? Like if he was 50, would they say, you know what, the math kind of works out. He could be. He could, he could have been around longer than Abraham. Abraham was two millennia before the arrival of Jesus. And they're saying, if you were 50, maybe we'd believe you. It's, it's, it's idiocy at its most rank and obvious state. It's called sin. Or what about when, when they try and challenge Jesus about the Sabbath? Remember this, they try and challenge him about the Sabbath. Now, I will remind you what I just said a moment ago. Jesus, as the eternal son, is perpetually upholding the universe by the word of his power. Now, the Jewish people understood this. The Jewish people had a fairly robust theology of creation, that God not only created the material world, but that God's energy, God's, God's intention is necessary in sustaining the material world. So, so Jesus says to them, he says, my father is working until now, and I am working. Now, again, if you're not 100% clear on all that Jesus is trying to say, you kind of just miss it. You sweep over it. You keep reading past it. And you fail to realize that here are Jesus' detractors trying to accuse him of breaking the Sabbath because he's working. And Jesus politely replies to them and says, if you would like me to stop working, the entire material universe will dissolve into non-existence. I'm happy to do it. Now, I, you think, well, that, that was quite a leap, Craig. But if you look at the nature of the Jewish theology about the fact that they didn't believe the Father could ever Sabbath, because if the Father ever truly Sabbathed, the entire material world would fail to exist because he not only creates it, but he sustains it. And Jesus says, just as you know the Father's working, I am working. The very fibers of your being, the very tongue in your mouth that you're using to attack me, I am right now holding together. I'm willing to stop if you want me to. This becomes, this becomes very comedic as you look at the life of Jesus and the way in which his own did not receive him. The world did not know him. He went to his own people and they received him not. This becomes laughable at junctures in the scripture. And laughable if only not, it wasn't clearly demonstrating the innate sinfulness of fallen man. But the upshot of our passage this morning in verse 12 is, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born, and this is the most essential part of all that we have to share this morning, is that those that will be children of God in the truest sense 
are not children of God through ethnic lineage. They're not children of God through cultural appropriation. They're not children of God because they act a certain way and talk a certain way. In fact, verse 13 is very clear. They are born, true children of God, not of blood. That means no one of the, of the Jewish nation are by default redeemed because they're Jewish. Now, if that upsets your sensibilities or, or that seems somewhat anti-Semitic to you, I can assure you there's no intentionality there at all except to clearly suggest that the only way to love people, Gentile or Jew, is to tell them the truth that outside of Jesus, they live a life which is at war with God and they will be condemned forthwith. Those that are true children of God are not thereby by birth or by blood or of the will of the flesh. You can't work yourself up into this. You can't generate in your own very human emotions faith and belief in God, nor of the will of man, but of God. It is a dark world. It is a very dark world. None of us should need convincing of that. But there is true light John tells us this true light has come into the world. It's pierced the darkness. And this true light is for everyone. It gives light to everyone. That's what John says. And it's come here for you and I. And curiously, the world was not waiting for this light. The world was happily going on in the drudgery of their sin. But this true light is not discovered at the end of a thousand recondite religious ceremonies. Just about every other world religion wants to promise you what? Enlightenment. Enlightenment. If only you work this hard and pilgrimage to this place and give up of all of these goods and these material worth and, and, and tithe and give offerings and, and pray and meditate and, and, and repeat your mantra and so on and so forth. The promise of enlightenment is a lie from hell. Because the true light has once for all come into the world. This coming into the world, this dark world that knows not the light, is demonstrated most forcefully by the rejection of Jesus at the hand of his own people. But this blazing, enlightening, thrilling, and all satisfying light is available to all, not by works, but to all who did receive him, who believed on his name. They are born again by the will of God. Would you bow your head and close your eyes here this morning as we want to close our study, a prayer dedicating these thoughts to God, that he would bless them, that he would cause them to bear fruit in our lives. Let us go to the Lord together. Father God, we thank you for this privilege today to sit under your word, to have your word carefully taught. Father, And I pray that I've been faithful to do that to bring about forcefully upon the minds of the hearers this morning the truths that you have inspired and canonized in this very passage. Lord God, may these truths, not by any force of me, the speaker, but by the force of you, the author, come home to bear upon the consciences of all who hear these words. May they bear fruit. If there are people here this morning who are living outside, God, your grace, and they are trying to work their way into your favor, they're trying to do enough, give enough, and be enough, may they repent of that religiosity. May they know that to all who just received Jesus and believed on his name, to them was given the right, Father, the divine right to become your children. Not by birth, not by their bloodline, not by all the works done in their flesh, not by their own sense of law keeping, but by repenting of all of that, turning to you, receiving Jesus Christ, who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, that they may truly be enlightened in the scriptural sense. Father, may this word bear fruit in all of our lives. If we are already redeemed, we are already your children by grace, May this word bear fruit in our lives. May it crystallize and clarify our thoughts of Jesus, particularly in contrast to John the baptizer. And help us, Lord God, all and each and every one to glorify you 
for what you have done and are doing in our lives and in our faith family. In Jesus' name.